Hello everyone, my name's Dave. I will be one of the tutors for KIB216 this semester and I'll also be giving two or three of the lectures, including the one this afternoon, which will be on the dynamic web. So this is going to basically explain what we're doing in this semester or at least the fundamentals that underpin it and how that's different from what you did in intro to web and then why we need to do it differently from what you did in intro to web. So I like to start uh, with a little bit of a history lesson on how the, the internet or the World Wide Web came to be uh, because I think a, an understanding of that uh, will benefit uh, your understanding of why we need to have dynamic websites. So the internet is not so much a single invention. It's not really easy to pinpoint down and go, okay, this is when the internet was invented. It was more like a com culmination of a lot of different areas of research and technologies and some that were even taken in directions that they weren't necessarily intended for. So it does make it hard to define but at the same time I think it makes it really interesting because there aren't too many things that have drawn such wide fields of research and technologies uh, into them. Uh, but we could ca categorize, uh, break down some of the things that make up the internet uh, into categories such as the physical, so the network infrastructure that carries all the information, so that's your cables, your cell phone towers, your ISPs, all of that sort of stuff. And then what you might call the logical, so how information is organized and transmitted along this infrastructure. So when we look at that, we start to look at things like uh, network protocols. Uh, then I've listed uh, the representational, so how we represent this data. And in our case, we're usually talking about representing this visually uh, in, in web interfaces. And then uh, finally the interactive, so the design of the user experience and how they interact with this data. So there's overlays with a bunch of these things and as web designers we'll, you'll mostly end up being interested in sort of the ones further towards the bottom. Uh, but I think some understanding of the, the physical and the logical that underpin that is going to be beneficial in, in helping you understand what you're designing for, what it's sitting on, and therefore how and why it needs to work the way it does. So you could, you could pick uh, pretty much any point in history and say this was, this particular technology contributed to the internet, but the place that uh, people usually start when they talk about uh, the, the, the very sort of first thing that kicked off what, what became the internet would be the advent of uh, packet switch networks. So that started around sort of the 1960s. So in 1958 uh, there was a organization called the US Defense Advanced Research Project Agency or DARPA uh, who still exists today and they are essentially a research wing of the United States military and this was around the time of the Cold War so one of the things that they were looking at was how can we create a robust network that networks all of our military installations such that in the event of a nuclear war if a big chunk of the network got taken out we could still communicate between them. And so the technology that was developed to deal with this was known as packet switching. So when you look at networking technology, you can basically break it down into uh, one of two methods, circuit switching and packet switching. Circuit switching is what you have when you make a phone call. And it might even be easy to visualize if you imagine a phone call back in the olden days that you would make where you call up an operator and they pull out a wire put it into another socket and then that connects you to someone else on a telephone line at the other end of the network. Now for the duration of that phone call you have a dedicated connection along that circuit and if that circuit gets broken your phone call uh, will end. And that's still the way that the, um, that the telephone network essentially works today unless you're talking about VoIP but the, the regular phone line when you're making a phone call you're essentially tying up that one circuit or that one 
path through, through the phone network to the other phone. And that incidentally is why the further away geographically the person is that you're making a phone call to, the more that's going to cost. If you're calling someone all the way over the other side of the world, then you're tying up one path through that network all the way from your phone to the person's phone on the other side of the world. So this networking already exists in the, in, in the phone, phone networking, uh, but the idea of packet switching uh, was to basically have a source computer uh, or a source anything really, telephone, but in this case a computer and a destination computer and once you've established a connection between those computers it doesn't really care which direction it takes through the network. So if part of the network is, is uh, severed or blown out then the, the information can find another way around that without having to restart uh, that communication. So the reason for the, the term packet and packet switching is because the way that they did this is they said, okay, we've got a bunch of data. What we're going to do is split it up into little chunks. So the little chunks being the packets, and we're going to send them all off individually. And we don't care which route they take through the network as long as they get to the end. And they may not even get to the end in the original order that we sent them, but uh, but they have sequence information in them, so as long as they all ultimately end up at the endpoint, they can be pieced back together in the original order, and then you have that bit of data. So in 1969, the uh, the ARPA was, or the the, the DARPA released um, or created the first packet switch network, which they called ARPANET. So this was uh, this was the first example of an internet. So there was this network and an internet essentially being one network connect to, connected to at least one other network. So the earliest forms of the internet were essentially this ARPANET and then later on they were connected up with various American university internets as well. And that became the first version of what the internet as it exists today really is. So we fast forward a little bit uh, to uh, the 80s and we have the U.S. National Science Foundation uh, who were commissioned to construction of the NSFNet, which was the university network backbone. And as I said, that was, that was uh, one of the, the networks that was then combined with ARPANET and created uh, the first sort of wide scale in terms of geography, so across uh, the, 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 the country of the United States that had networks all connected. And that was still going until the mid 90s uh, when it was decommissioned and basically the ownership of the network infrastructure was overtaken by commercial telecommunications companies. So you might often hear it said that nobody owns the internet and that's true to an extent but when you're talking about the cables that carry the data uh, someone does have to actually own them and maintain them. And for the most part, uh, since the mid-90s, this has been commercial telecommunication companies. So this is uh, a network map of uh, the major network connections between different nodes in the United States. And they're color-coded based on uh, what corporation uh, sort of owns and manages them. So you can see the big ones at least uh, Verizon, AT&T, they're all telecommunications companies. And likewise in Australia essentially it's Telstra that, that owns the, uh, the network and then other people can sort, sort of pay to use them. Um, okay, so moving on. So that sort of covers the, the physical section of it, uh, the, the network infrastructure. So we had, before the advent of the World Wide Web, we had the internet, which is the physical cables connecting computers uh, around around the country and then around the world. The first inter international connection was between uh, the uh, a research, I forget its name, research place in England, the same place that uh, Alan Turing was from, had a connection to the American mainland and then had the global internet. So now that this network infrastructure was in place around about 1989 to 1990, uh, this guy here, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, while working at CERN, basically invented the World Wide Web uh, in a proposal for an information management system 
that presented data in a common and consistent way. So you might recognize uh, that the place that he was working, CERN there, uh, as the, the same place that the LHC is, and it is indeed the same place, uh, the European Center for Nuclear Research. So you might ask, what does a guy working at a particle physics place uh, care about uh, networks and the internet? <clears throat> and the answer to that is, Basically, he was working with scientists, and scientists work with data, and particularly in, in a place uh, like a, a nuclear research laboratory, you get massive, massive amounts of data. And when you're working with data, you want to share that data with other scientists so that you can get consensus and, and uh, that sort of thing. So he basically saw this, and he wanted to develop a way, so he was getting all this information from all their experiments, he wanted to develop a way of storing that information and being able to have it easily accessible in, and indexed by uh, anyone from any scientific institution around the world. So when you know that, it does kind of make sense why a guy working at a particle physics laboratory would create the World Wide Web. So he created, uh, he basically invented the hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, uh, the hypertext markup language, HTML, and also the first web browser and the first uh, web server. So by the 6th of August 1991, he managed to sell this up and the first website went online and it was essentially a, uh, essentially a website that just said, okay, this is what the World Wide Web is all about. So it's very simple and it defines the World Wide Web as a wide area hypermedia information retrieval initiative aiming to give universal access to a large universe of documents. So you can see that really all, all he was concerned about was uh, having documents and having them uh, be able to be easily found and to put links in between each other. Yeah, he didn't even really invent the concept of, of hypertext that uh, other people had sort of thought of this, this thing of non-linear linking stories back since the 1940s. But it all sort of came together and uh, he created the World Wide Web and whether he knew it or not, um, he managed to have the foresight or the good luck of making it generic enough so that essentially with the exact same technology over the last 20 years it has scaled to be able to support things that I'm sure that he never initially imagined. So that's uh, actually an archived copy of the very first web page. You can still find it at uh, W3C's website. As you can see all it is is, is text and links and uh, and so if you can think about the, the kind of websites, interfaces, the kind of media that, that work on the internet today, it's it's almost a miracle that it works on the exact same underlying technology that just treats data as data and leaves the representation of it up to whoever else. Okay, so we move on to uh, sort of the early 90s and the internet has become a thing and we get early adopters of the World Wide Web, uh, primarily university-based scientific departments or research laborati laboratories. But a turning point uh, was the introduction of, the Mo of Mosaic, which was one of the first graphical web browsers, and that was released in 1993. So that's a screenshot of Mosaic, and it's essentially the precursor to every graphical web browser that we have today and you can see it looks you know it looks not dissimilar to anything that we might use today so so this was this was probably the thing that kicked off uh, internet popular popularly in the mainstream um, <clears throat> because it, it and you'll notice this trend that the, the more visual the interfaces to the data and the interaction become, then the more widespread the use of the internet becomes. <coughs> so it introduced such revolutionary features as uh, displaying images in line with text. Um, but as I said, essentially this was the forebearer to every, uh, every other modern web browser that we've had since. 
So around about this time, the bandwidth was limited by the network technologies. Okay, so you didn't have a lot of broadband. It was mainly dial-up modems, which operated 56,000 bits per second, which is not a lot. It's about 7,000 characters a second. Uh, but the web began to grow from a few hundred web pages. Uh, there wasn't any great sense of web design, visual design, mainly because the browser technologies didn't yet support it. Uh, but there is a clear trend towards more visual, more accessible web. So around about 1993, when they figured out that they were on something with this internet thing, uh, in 1993 CERN agreed that anyone can use the web protocol and code royalty free. So they essentially gave away one of the greatest inventions in history for nothing. Um, but that was a pretty good move because there were other protocols uh, that made you pay to use their surf services. Uh, there was one called Gopher and the fact that probably no one remembers that today uh, is a good indication that they probably didn't go the right path with charging people to use it. Uh, so in 1994, Tim Berners-Lee found the, founded the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, which was and remains the main international standards organization for the World Wide Web. Okay, so they are tasked with basically <coughs> developing the HTML standards. So every time a new version of the HTML standards is released from 4 to 5 and so forth, uh, they're the people who are responsible for going, okay, this is what's going to go into that. Okay, we'll go sort of towards uh, the mid to late 90s, where commercial interest in capitalizing on the growth of the web started to become a thing. So we start to see e-commerce, have websites like Amazon and eBay opening up. The increased commercial uh, investment is pushed the technology to a point where there was a legitimate role for web designers. Okay, so as soon as people wanted to start selling things, uh, they needed to have people who were designing the most effective ways for communicating that thing to the user. Uh, and we also had uh, the first early examples of user-created content. So instead of, instead of the web user being a, a passive consumer, uh, we start to see uh, things like GeoCities, which, uh, which sadly has been shut down recently, but was one of the first uh, places where you could go and create your own web page. And I believe you can download a tonnage of the entire GeoCities if you uh, really want to go back for some nostalgia. Uh, so this was also around the time of uh, the Browser Wars, or the first Browser Wars. So, which was essentially uh, Netscape versus Internet Explorer. So Net Netscape was one of the first, uh, Netscape was kind of on the scene first, I guess. It was probably the first really popular web browser. And then uh, Microsoft came along with Internet Explorer and um, you know saw reasons to dominate the market on that. And so, what this sort of ended up in was a feature arms race. So they went, okay, well, people will use our browser if it supports the coolest stuff. Uh, whether or not that adheres to any standards. So we start to see more features added quite rapidly. So we get things like tables and frames, allow more complex layouts, support for animated GIFs, uh, JavaScript for client-side uh, interaction. So things like button rollovers. Uh, were a simple first example for that, and so that was one of the that was one of the things driving driving the bra the browser wars as sort of the arms race for for features. But really, the thing that really the thing that made Internet Explorer dominant was the fact that they were able to bundle it with their operating system, and so most people not really caring to change their default web browser just ended up <coughs> using Internet Explorer by default. And you see by around about the turn of the century that they were essentially uh, had a monopoly on the browser market and so they ended up getting in trouble for that, it's antitrust lawsuits and such. But what you'll then notice is that there's a steady decline after that and kind of around about now we're in what some people refer to as the, the second lot of browser wars. So after Internet Explorer dominated they essentially stopped innovating. That was, that was their mistake. 
So then all these other browsers came along like Mozilla Firefox and Chrome and Safari. Ended up uh, adding new features and um, at the same time adhering better to web standards. And by the time that Internet Explorer uh, or Microsoft kind of realized this, they, they'd already started to slip behind to the point where I believe now Internet Explorer for the first time is not uh, the dominant browser in terms of people using it. Okay, but the point about this was, again, sort of commercial pressures force people to want to dominate the marketplace. And this actually, in one way, was good because it drove innovation. In another way, it was bad because it led towards uh, deviation from standards. And if you ever talk to anyone about trying to make a website work in IE6, they'll tell you how bad that is. Um, so still around this time, we have the trend towards advertising a web presence rather than offering useful content or services. So this led to websites which were stuffed full of attention-seeking bells and whistles, whether they served a purpose or not. Okay, so I've got a few examples there. I'm sure we're all aware of them. I've got a couple of links to uh, some archives of sort of 90s era web design, uh, which, which are quite interesting. But the upshot of all this was more often than not, this approach distracted from the com content and made it less accessible. So this is one example of, of a website. I'm still not really sure if this is an elaborate joke or if it's real. Because um, this is a super design studio, and they say things like we use advanced tools like Notepad and <laughs> such and such. But uh, but the uh, and this is <laughs> this is probably not even a particularly heinous example. It's hard to find it's hard to find archives of old websites now, which is a little bit sad. But and I mean, it's easy to criticize. It's easy to criticize a design like this. Um, it's hard, it, but I think it's more useful to analyze. Why? And I mean, back then, there wasn't a huge amount of content on the web. So it sort of made sense to make your website uh, eye-catching rather than particularly informative. Um, and, and, you know, the whole, the whole habit of going, oh, we've got something new, let's chuck it in just because, is not something that ever really went away. I can guarantee any time any new technology is added, uh, to a web browser, um, a whole bunch of people will jump on it, and it will be cool for a little while until it becomes saturated, and then, and then people will kind of get over it. So, but this this was generally kind of the way that websites happened uh, in, in in sort of mid to late nineties. They weren't necessarily concerned about offering useful content or anything. They really just wanted to go, hey, I'm here. I'm a company and I've got a website, so I'm pretty cool. Okay, so we go from 1998 to 2000, and we start to see traditional interface design principles start to be seriously applied to website designs. So you start to get a lot of people who are uh, from from print media and, and graphic design coming over and applying their uh, design knowledge to the interfaces for websites. Now that browsers uh, or web browsers and, and HTML standards have the uh, ability to support uh, this kind of thing. So we start to see web development tools like Dreamweaver promote a more visual approach workflow to a web interface design. At the same time, content is becoming more important and web, web design begins to focus on servicing that content. But presentation and content are still combined, specified within the HTML markup, so it's not possible to update one independent of the other. So at this point, we didn't have anything like CSS. Uh, all, of the, all of the styling and the content was all contained within the HTML. Website layouts of this period uh, look square because they're based mostly on HTML tables. Uh, so again, we didn't have things like CSS for layout, so the only way to lay out content on the page was to create a grid with a table and put the content in that. It was essentially an abuse of their intended use, but try telling someone not to do that when it's the only way that they can do it. Fortunately, we have better ways of doing it now. So this is a, a screenshot of uh, the Alista Part website. 
is sort of a web, web design oriented website from around that era. And you can see it's very much grid related. You could picture exactly where the, the grid lines that for, for the various cells of the table that they laid it out in are uh, in that. Okay, and then we come to 1999 to 2001, where we have the dot com boom and bust. So around this time, commercially at least, everyone wanted to jump on the dot com bandwagon. And a lot of money was thrown at entrepreneurs without solid business plans because of the novelty of the dot com concept, leading to the tech bubble and subsequent bust when they realized that they didn't actually have anything to sell. So then we move on to 2000 to 2004. We start to see high speed internet connectivity becoming more affordable. There's a push towards web standards headed by the uh, W3C that we talked about earlier. There's a continuing trend of more content more often. We start to see things like CSS that allow us to separate uh, the presentation and content so that they can be updated independently of each other. And we're moving away from static web pages towards dynamic websites. So more on that later. This is a screenshot of CSS Zen Garden. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this already. But this is essentially uh, the site which demonstrates uh, the awesomeness of CSS. So you can take the same content, exact same HTML file, and apply uh, various different CSS files to it and change the look and feel of it entirely. Move on to 2004 to 2007, we have what uh, some people might call the Web 2.0 era. So we start to think of web interfaces more as, or certain, certain websites anyway, more as web applications rather than websites. So instead of a series of pages, we start to view them as an interactive interface more akin to what a native desktop application might be. So what characterizes these is that they're highly dynamic, uh, often community oriented. Uh, there's user contributed multimedia content and lots and lots of it. And interactivity and functionality are approaching native desktop applications. So this was around the time where social networking takes off. Okay, so 2005 I think was when Facebook started. Uh, purchasing goods and services online via sites like eBay and Amazon becomes mainstream to the point where it threatens traditional retailers. So Amazon started way back in the mid 90s and eBay I think around about the same time, but it sort of had this slow burn until a critical point of, a, of adoption of, so people adopting the internet, but then also the, the speed of the network technology and the interface themselves making it easy enough uh, that even though it was probably always going to happen, it had to reach that point before it started to become not even mainstream, but even possibly more mainstream than, than buying things at retail. Uh, so just a few screenshots of some of the examples of websites that sort of fit this web, more web application-ish model. Uh, so we've got Flickr for photo sharing, Wikipedia for encyclopedia information, YouTube for videos, and Facebook for social networking. They're all highly interactive and dynamic websites. And then sort of from 2008 onwards, there's a trend towards real-time or almost real-time content updates. Trends for content to find users rather than users going searching for content, so things like RSS feed, subscriptions, Twitter updates, for example. Uh, a trend for storing personal data in the cloud, um, which just in the last couple of years has been a real big push towards. So essentially the recognition that we don't have one terminal that uh, gives us access to the internet and to our data, having our identity online, and then having that push to any device that we might happen to have on us at the time. Uh, as content mashups, so you're not just essentially your one walled off website, you're combining information from lots of other websites. Uh, so things like embedded widgets, feeds, and services using external APIs, and designed for multiple devices, um, particularly mobile but then also all sorts of other things like uh, internet TVs and 
fridges and vacuum cleaners and whatever else. Um, so again, just some examples of, of uh, websites that indicate those things. So I've got Twitter there uh, for the real time updates. We've got Facebook on the mobile. So mobile web design is, is a big thing and one that we're going to focus on the second uh, half of, of this subject. And uh, Google Maps, uh, which is uh, one of the ultimate examples of content matching up. Uh, if you've done interface and information design, um, that should all be quite familiar to you. So that's our history lesson. Uh, what are the trends? Essentially, more content, more frequently, up-to-date and on-demand from more different sources. So user contributions, crowdsourcing, and then also mashing up uh, a, a content from across the web. And particularly moving away from a static web towards a dynamic web. And just as a side note, in terms of your role as a web designer, uh, it has changed along the way as well. So for any website or web application now, there's more contributors. And as a web designer, you need to at least have an understanding of all these areas and how they fit together. So you can't just be a graphic designer. You can't just be a coder. You can't just be an electrical engineer to some extent. You have to have a little bit of all of these if you want to work within the web ecosystem. And depending on the size of the project, you may inhabit one of these roles, you may inhabit many of them, or you may indeed inhabit all of them. Okay, so let's get technical a little bit, uh, just for a moment, and we'll talk about, uh, so this is leading into dynamic websites, but I, I need to briefly mention uh, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, HTTP. <clears throat> so this sits on the sort of the logic layer of how we organize information and how we request it uh, from, from a web server. So HTTP functions as a request response protocol in the client server computing model. Okay, so request response and client server are the two important terms there. So client server essentially means if we're talking about the usual case of you browsing the web, client is your web browser on your computer and the server is a computer sitting somewhere that's connected 24 seven to the internet, running an application which accepts your request from your browser and then delivers a resource. Now that resource in the case of a static website might be a file. In the case of a dynamic website, what it's more likely to be is the output of a program and that program will usually do things like go and grab information out of a database and then combine it with some uh, HTML and then output that back to the browser. So uh, the client submits an HTTP request message to the server and the server returns a response message to the client which contains the completion stat uh, status information about the request and may also contain requested content in its message body. So the first thing that uh, the web server sends back is not necessarily the web page that you asked for. You'll notice this little diagram down here. For you to actually connect and get a page, you have to do a few connections. First, you have to connect your ISP, do the DNS lookup, so which is if I want a web address like google.com, then what's the IP address that relates to that, get that. And then I try to establish a connection with Google. And it goes, sends a message back to me going, yes, we've got a connection. And at that point, then I can make my request for the web page. And then, and then uh, if it's a successful web request, it will uh, start sending me the data for the web page in packets, as we said before. And then once I've got all of those packets, then I reassemble them in the order that they're meant to be, and I can render my web page. Unfortunately, this entire process, even if it goes all the way around the world, takes place in usually in about under a second. Okay, and this is actually what a HTTP request looks like uh, behind the scenes. So when you're doing it, you're typing an address into the web browser and you're hitting send, you can actually do this using a, a console application by typing some commands. Probably can't read it from there, but all that's saying is uh, it's uh, using the get command, which is an HTTP request command, it's saying get me the uh, 
<coughs> Wikipedia homepage. So that's the part that's uh, in red here. That's the request. And then the response is broken up into a response header and the response body. The response header contains uh, essentially information about the response, the most important one being the response code. If everything goes well, that's 200, which means OK. If you've ever gotten a 404 page, then that's what the response header will tell uh, your client. If it can't find the resource, you will just get a response header back with a 404 error message and your browser will know to render a 404 uh, page not found. In this case, it's a successful request, so as well as the response header, it also returns the response body, uh, which if you could read that, you will see that's the part that is what you see if you uh, go and view the source of your web page. So the response body uh, contains the HTML. Uh, but I just show this to show you that uh, it's not necessarily a simple matter of going and get a file, send it back. Okay, we have to have all this other information uh, within the protocol to say that yes, we've got the connection, no, we haven't got it, all that sort of thing. Okay, but don't, don't worry, we won't ever have to get that technical in our examples. <laughs> okay, so this is probably the most important uh, slide of the presentation. Uh, and if you only take away one thing from this, uh, this is the one I want you to understand. So the difference between the static website and the dynamic website. So on the left here, we have the static website. And if you think about the assignments that you did in Intro to Web, Okay, this is essentially the request response cycle that happened when, if I'm browsing the website that you did there, you have one or more HTML files sitting on a web server. Uh, I'm here on my, uh, on my client device, on my computer, running a web browser. I make an HTTP request and the server gets the URL and from that, in, a, in the case of a static web server, it essentially points straight to a file. So it goes, okay, go get that file and then send that back as part of the HTTP response. Okay, so pretty simple to understand uh, and fairly bulletproof to implement. Now, on the right side here, we have the same thing that would happen if you had a dynamic website. So the difference between the static and dynamic website isn't particularly evident on the client side. If you're in a web browser, it's not particularly easy to know if you're getting a static web page or you're getting a dynamic web page. The real difference is, is what happens on the web server. So in the static website, there's just files on the web server and they're delivered as they are. On the dynamic website, what we have is a program or a script running which accepts the URL and then uses that to determine uh, what resource it wants to get. But in this case, the resources aren't static files. It's usually a database and then maybe other documents or scripts. <coughs> and it uses that to go and grab information from the database, combine it with some HTML markup, and then it sends that back uh, as part of the HTTP response as HTML. So as far as the client is concerned, it's just getting back HTML. But the difference is that the way that HTML was generated on the static web server, it's just sending the file. On the dynamic web server, it's, there's, there's no files that represent the individual page. It's on the fly interpreting the URL and then using some logic in, in, a, in a script or an application to get uh, information for the database, combine it with markup, and then send that back as HTML to the web browser. So this is essentially the model that we're going to be using uh, for our first assignment. Okay, so as I said with the static website, each logical page is represented by a physical file on the web server. There are some ex advantages of static websites. First of all, there's a lower entry barrier for development. Okay, all you need to be able to do is create an HTML file, copy it across to a server, and then it's essentially accessible. 
Uh, there's simpler hosting requirements. You don't have to have any applications running or databases running on the web server. Uh, and they're also easily cacheable. <coughs> uh, so caching being caching being where if you if I've downloaded a web page and I go and request it later again, it's part of the HTTP request response. Uh, I send a essentially a timestamp, and if the web page on the web server hasn't been updated, there's no point in downloading again. So I'll just load my local copy. Uh, that's easier to do when they're just files as opposed to when the pages don't actually exist. They're sort of created dynamically on the fly. Uh, and they can also be viewed offline. Again, because you're just downloading a file, uh, you can save that file and, and view it online. Oh, offline, sorry. Now, the disadvantages of a static website, uh, essentially they're static. <laughs> but that means that there's much less scope for personalization or interactivity. Uh, any, any scripting that you do has to be done on the client side, so a JavaScript. But you can't do things necessarily like have logins, remember who the user is, uh, uh, dynamically change the contents that's delivered to them based on who they are or what time of day it is or anything else. You basically just have one version of a page and that's what it is uh, unless it's updated. Speaking of updating, when you do have to update it, every little change uh, needs to be done manually. So probably the first example that you'll notice from this, I don't know if anyone did go back and modify their uh, website from intro to web, but <coughs> if you did, let's just say you had 10 pages, you had a menu, each of those pages had 10 links to the, or nine links to the other, other pages in the website. And let's say I wanted to change uh, either the text on one of the menu items or even a link, anything about that. Then I have to go into each one of those 10 pages, make the change, save it, re-upload to the web server. And that's just a very simple case. Whereas if I had done that dynamically, let's say I had have stored the menu names in a database, and then dynamically output the HTML of that menu on, on each page, uh, then the only thing I would have to do to change that is go into my database, change one little thing, and then because the web page is generated dynamically, it would output the new menu straight away. So while it does seem when you're starting that it takes more time to create a, a dynamic website, the time that you save down the track is uh, multiple, multiple times more. Okay, so another very simple example, but when you start to look at some of the more complex web applications, you start to see that, well, actually, it's pretty much impossible to have a static website uh, for something like a YouTube or a Wikipedia or a Facebook. So just some stats, and these are, these are a little bit old, so they'll be even more astronomical now. Uh, but 24 hours of video is uploaded to YouTube every minute. More than 30 billion pieces of content uh, are shared each month in over 30 languages on Facebook, I think that was, and 50 million tweets are sent per day. Uh, now, it doesn't matter how big your team of uh, content editors is, there's no way that you could possibly manually handle that amount of content. Uh, to, to update all those pages in a static web page. <clears throat> so, so as I said, there's insane amounts of content, especially user-generated content, uh, and these numbers are just growing uh, more and more. Uh, but fortunately, computers are very good at automating repetitive tasks in a dynamic way. So essentially, Essentially, dynamic websites are not just something that's, uh, you know, becomes a little bit more convenient. It's really the only way that modern web applications can actually work. There's, there's zero way that you could possibly implement most uh, modern websites uh, in a static fashion. Okay, so dynamic website is website where the content is stored in a database and or other external sources and assembled with markup and output by a web server script or application and then delivered back to the web browser. As far as the web browser is concerned, it sees 
the same thing, just an HTML page, but it's the way that HTML page has been assembled on the server which makes it different. So the advantages of dynamic websites should be fairly obvious now. Content can be updated in a decentralized way. A single webmaster does not have the sole privilege or responsibility of updating the website. And we can have modular, modularization and reuse of common code. So the example I mentioned before, instead of writing out the header and the menu on every single page on your website, just make it once and you can dynamically output that header code on, on any part of the website that you like. And also automation. Okay, so things like uh, things like uh, uploading a video to YouTube. Okay, there's not someone who goes, yeah, I've got that video, let's go and convert it to another format and then and upload it again. That stuff all gets done dynamically okay, by applications on the web server. Things like uh, uh, when we get to look at WordPress, you can uh, automate the publishing of your posts. So I have a WordPress blog that I'm going to be using for these tutorials. Some of them I've already done, but I don't want them to be published yet. So instead of having to remember to publish them each day that I want them to publish, I can set that date uh, to, to a later date and it will automatically go, okay, it's this date, make this post available now. As well as things like uploading an image to a gallery, okay, we can crop images or even generate an HTML gallery uh, just from the image that's being uploaded. And then that gallery is uh, visible instantly to the user. We don't have to go and create the HTML and create a new web page uh, and then have some delay before they can actually see that content on the website. Uh, there are some disadvantages of dynamic websites. Obviously, there's a slightly higher entry barrier learning curve for development. Uh, there are more complex web server requirements. So we have to have make sure that the web server has uh, uh, so the web application stack running on it. So usually that's something like PHP or maybe ASP, but we'll get into that more later. And there can be issues with pages being indexed by a search engine. So you can imagine it's, it's easy enough for a search engine to trawl static pages on a web server and then index the content. It's not so easy when those pages don't necessarily exist to, to try and get all the information that might be hidden in the database. But there are ways of addressing that as well. But generally, overall, the benefits will pretty much always outweigh the advantages. Um, and that will only, be, only become more and more so true. I, I would highly doubt that you will find uh, even a small percentage of modern websites would still be static. I think you'd possibly reserve those for... Your static, with, your static web design would probably be reserved now for email newsletters. Um, and maybe like some sort of pamphlet thing. Other than that, you're going to find that pretty much all websites of any size or any frequency of use are going to be dynamic websites. So really, if you want to work in web design at all, then this is going to be the way that you're working. Uh, okay, so that's it. Any questions?